Some city merchants discuss fire safety after yesterday's blaze in Reed Street. The Barbados Fire Service closely monitoring that area for any flare-ups. Barbados still has one of the lowest suicide rates in the world. And in sports, Empire and KPL registered the first wins in Group F of the Prime Minister's Cup. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. Several city merchants are leaving no stone unturned to implement fire safety measures at their businesses. It comes as the fire officers keep watch at the site of yesterday's major fire at Reed Street. Lorna Jones reports. Many merchants in the Bridgetown area have installed fire detection and other prevention systems. But there are some who have indicated they are yet to do so. Chief Fire Officer Arrow Maynard says his team has been working in particular with owners of one-door shops to implement mitigating strategies. Like early warning systems, fire alarm systems, um, and training the staff to recognize uh, an incident and also what to do if an incident occurs. So we are working with the persons in the Bridgetown area to address that. If you have to do any material um, repairs or work to your building door, it is required that you put in a secondary exit. Owner of Elliott's Enterprises, Ayo Alin, says his building insurance is up to date while smoke detectors and fire extinguishers are in place. If I want to implement technology to be able to um, help alert me as to when a fire, or even prevent when a fire comes. So I'm about to invest in some um, smart smoke detectors, uh, so some other smart devices, uh, smart breakers, um, different uh, stuff like that, so that I can get first hand alerts and then the, the fire department get first hand alerts. And even a fire prevention system, I even looking at that. I was seeing some, some budget friendly ones online and I realized that businesses here, well, you would find mostly fire prevention. Um, systems in the bigger corporations. They seem that these the automatic sprinkler systems in department stores. Meanwhile, owner of K's Creation, Seamstress Kim Benjamin, believes some small business owners do not see fire safety measures as a priority until there's an incident. Whenever fire occurs, then is when you see somebody would always come up and say, I should this or should do this or should have done that. But normally you just go along your everyday life. Nobody actually checks on that. So, and even until yesterday, we had a recent fire just around the corner, and it's then is when everybody's saying that we should put things in place, and since it quells down, nobody has time for that again. Chairman of the Bridgetown Revitalization Committee, Eddie Abed, says while it will be a challenge to change one door or landlock structures, business owners must put early warning systems in place. So what we have been advocating is you need to have enough of a head start, enough of a lead time that you're informed there's a fire. So without question, you need fire alarms. Um, once people can be informed there's a fire, there are several things that can be done. You can have fire extinguishers, you can have fire reels, and most importantly, fire blankets. There are enough fire blankets that not only your staff, but your customers are protected. Fire blankets are designed that they can withstand heat for a few seconds, and that's all you need, enough to get them out through the store. September 3rd marked 14 years since six young women perished in a fire at the popular campus trains boutique during a robbery. Fire officers' efforts to get the young women out of the one-door store proved futile. They died as a result of smoke inhalation. The tragedy, which rocked the nation, led to calls for building codes in the city to be enforced. Lorna Jones, CBC News. Well, as we just told you, the Barbados Fire Service is keeping an eye on the site of yesterday's fire at Reed Street. Divisional Officer Marlon Small says they are working to ensure the heat has been removed from the rubble to prevent the fire from reigniting. And also, it reduces the impact of smoke on the residents, which can create a medical emergency for some persons who are asthmatics. In addition to that, it reduces the impact of greenhouse gases on the environment. The Barbados Fire Service will be maintaining a fire watch on this structure until all of those hot spots have been extinguished. And we are sure that there's no possibility of any reigniting of this fire. 
In other news now, though Barbados has seen an increase in suicides, the island still has one of the lowest rates in the world. Consultant psychiatrist with the Ministry of Health at the Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Joy Sue, says the rate stood at 1.6 prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, a recent cluster of suicides has seen it move to above two. Dr. Sue says the problem is arising in people between the ages of 16 and 30. She shared information on Morning Barbados on a rapid analysis conducted into the causes of the suicides in the cluster. One of them was access, meaning access, persons having access to care, and, and some of the other factors were persons having an underlying illness. And the two things together can be you know, problematic. So we have been working on trying to improve persons' access. Only recently, the Ministry of Health would have um, provided us with extra staff and staff and community service. So now we have our own social workers and psychologists out there. And especially where the psychological services were needed, I think that was a good step for a step in the right direction in terms of improving the access. Ahead of World Suicide Prevention Day on September the 10th, Dr. Sue says heightened education awareness of mental health and mental illness is required. The day will be observed under the theme, Change the Narrative. The psychiatric hospital here launched a suicide prevention program, and we're using that team which is Change the Narrative start conversation because we need to get away from having this as a taboo subject. And that goes for mental health in general, not just suicide. So we need to get away from thinking of mental health as something taboo. I try to get people to speak more openly about it. A teenager is facing a number of charges, including murder. He is 18-year-old Damari Akeem Daquan Nurse of Briar Hall, Kendall Hill, Christchurch. That young man faces three criminal damage charges for acts committed in June and July three endangering of life charges committed in June and August, and three counts of unlawful use of a firearm committed in June and August. Nurses also accused of the murder of Dadrian Ward on the 16th of August. The killing of Ward was homicide number 30. The Sanitation Service Authority is tonight warning individuals about disposing of animal carcasses in their garbage bins. Public Relations Officer Carl Padmore says those found to be breaking the law will be prosecuted. He tells CBC News when they first received word of the issue, after viewing photos, they thought it was a prank. It's the most disgusting thing that we've experienced in our um, existence. I checked and we would see dead animals next to the road, we would see dead animals in gullies, but for someone to actually place a dead animal into the receptacle is very concerning. It's causing a nuisance uh, to the community, one. Secondly, uh, the person, the bin does not belong to this premises. So the person is trespassing by bringing their bin to this area and disposing of um, the carcass. So we want to let Barbadians know that the SSA is not tolerating this behavior and we will do everything possible to bring that owner um, to justice. A resident in the Silver Sands area, Anthony Williams, says he was told about the development by his sister. He says the bin with the half of the animal protruding out was placed at the top of his driveway. He adds he did his best to control the smell by applying white lime and wrapping the bin in garbage bags until it could be removed. I've never seen anything like it. And um, for someone to actually go through the motions and uh, I don't know if it was, I don't know what kind of intent if they had, I, I just, I'm just dumbfounded by, by the discovery actually. But it is disturbing. Obviously it will, it will smell and there will be fallout from it. So my only thing is to, my only hope is to get it wrapped up as quickly as possible and um, you know, so we can dispose of whatever is in it and find whoever is responsible for doing it. Well, the matter has been referred to the Barbados Police Service and Health Inspectors for action. We'll take a break here, but coming up, the UWI Kfield campus helping build a cadre of entrepreneurs. The University of the West Indies Kfield campus is seeking to help its students who are entrepreneurs grow their businesses. 
According to Student Services Manager Khalid Holder, student entrepreneurship is seen as a major aspect of campus life. He was speaking at the Campus 2024 Orientation Fair and Interclub Committee Expo. We want to help our entrepreneurs to build their entrepreneurial capacity because one of our graduate attributes is to create entrepreneurial thinking among our students. And so this orientation fair features student entrepreneurs who are doing amazing work in a wide range of areas, whether it is film, um, products like body scrubs. Well, owner of Divine Skin, Amanda Marshall, who is studying biochemistry, says she's transferring the knowledge and skills she's acquiring through her studies to developing self-care products. I was able to use my biochemistry degree to help me understand how to make skincare products. My products are all natural. 54 children of the St. Michael's South constituency were given a special gift over the weekend as the new school term nears. The Back to School initiative is organized by Member of Parliament for the area, Kirk Humphrey, annually for those children who completed the common entrance exam. Mr. Humphrey is thankful for the assistance received from Corporate Barbados, noting it goes beyond the politician and is about helping the children to succeed. Mr. Humphrey says it will also assist them with the transition to secondary school. We do it for all the children in the community who would have done the 11 plus and are transitioning to secondary school. And what we do here is uh, twofold, well, threefold. We offer the items to help with back to school, like the school bag, uh, toiletries, scientific calculator, uh, geometry sets, and so on. But we also use the opportunity to uh, talk to the children about what to expect when they go to secondary school and give them a motivational talk. I normally use a young person that they could relate to from the community who would have gone on and would have done well, or for whom, you know, the story that they have could resonate with the children. And then they also talk to the parents and ask them to support the children, particularly during the transition period, because that is the most difficult period. And it normally goes well. This year we had 54 children who would have been transitioning to secondary school. Mr. Humphrey says they also discussed picnic options as relaxation is key before taking that step into a new space. They think children also have to relax, so we do the back to school, the official program, and then we do a picnic to allow the children to relax. And as I said, I've done it seven years uh, before I became the MP, and every year since I've become the MP. And I think it is a, a process whereby we want to celebrate the children. I do not pick out the children who did uh, the best in the exam, the most improved in the exam. We do everybody. So there's no discrimination. Nobody can say, look, you've identified so-and-so. No, it is like a community graduation and we celebrate the children. We encourage the parents to applaud for their children. The children are happy to take pictures because they see it as a graduation. Cancer survivor Shalana David is working on a project to help children experiencing what she went through. Working with the Barbados Cancer Society, she is raising funds to help Barbadian children struggling with pediatric cancer. Anesta Henry has that story. Shalana David is a two-time cancer survivor who knows what it is to fight through the physical and financial pain that comes with battling the disease. It's because of this that to mark Child Cancer Awareness Month, observed in September, she came up with the idea for the Barbados Cancer Society to organize a cake sale, concert, and catwalk to raise funds for children battling cancer. She says the society helped her family with financial, social, and psychological support during challenging times. It has definitely helped me and my family a lot over the past years. It has helped in so many ways, like in groceries. A time my mother had, she had no groceries in the house. Olivia bought a whole big, big box of groceries, made the whole family cry. Um, when my mother cut out a fork, Christmas gifts for me or my family, she would bring gifts over. They helped me with a bank account. They helped me in so many special ways that I can't even name all of them. Diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia at six years old and then again at age 12, Ms. David wants to make a difference in the lives of children fighting the fight she fought. The 16-year-old's desire is for the event, in addition to being a fundraising effort, 
to be a source of hope. I could give books and books and books of hard stories about how hard it was, but I would say if I hadn't gone through it, that I wouldn't have met the people that I have met today, I wouldn't be the person that I am, and I wouldn't be a part of the society. The teenager's word of advice to children and adults battling cancer is to trust God. I can remember a mindset that I had was that I do something so bad that God had to punish me like this, that every wrong deed that I did, and this was the punishment. But then a day I talked to my mom about it, and she helped me to realize that, no, this was the working of sin. God had nothing to do with this. So what I would say to them was trust God. Just keep believing in God, even when it feels like he has forgotten you. Chairman of the Society's Welfare Subcommittee, Dr. Greg Padmore, says the funds from the event will go a long way in assisting families. We look at the impact on not only the child but the family as well and how best we can assist in care of these of these children. The event is scheduled to take place this Saturday between 3 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. at the St. Gabriel School. Anesta Henry, CBC News. Anesta, thank you. Prime Minister Mia Amar Motley says the news of Joseph Goddard's death comes as a shock. The former General Secretary of the National Union of Public Workers has passed away just weeks after the death of his successor, Dennis Clark. Wendy Burke reports. The labor movement has been thrown into mourning again within a few short weeks. Former NUPW General Secretary Joseph Goddard, who spent over 34 years in trade unionism, passed away yesterday. Prime Minister Motley, in expressing condolences to his family in a statement, reflected that she first met Joe when she was a young law student at the London School of Economics, where he was studying for his master's degree in industrial relations and personnel management. She says that was the very first ever face-to-face -face with him, but the name was quite familiar to her because by then he was a household name in Barbados and he was the face and voice of the NUPW, an institution whose membership he served faithfully and vigorously from 1973 to 2007, most of it as General Secretary. Ms. Motley has described him as a trade unionist through and through. She says as leader of the NUPW, he was also at the table for the discussions that led to the creation of the groundbreaking social partnership and the prices and incomes protocol that emerged from it, setting up Barbados as a world model for handling national crises. Former president of the NUPW, Walter Bologna, says Mr. Goddard was a visionary and an unabridged socialist. We would have used the trade union movement to address the inconsistencies and unfurnished within the public service. Joe did many things for the service. Some of them will be listed. He made certain that technical officers were able to find promotion within the public service. He fought all, not only for salaries, but also for allowances and fringe benefits. Many officers today will receive travel, telephone, clothing, shoes, and washing allowances among other things, should give thanks to Joseph Goddard. Mr. Maloney says nurses and other workers receive car loans thanks to Mr. Goddard's tenacity. Wendy Burt, CBC News. Sports Night Time, and we're joined this evening by Damien Best. Damien, good evening. Good evening to you, Pearson. Good evening to our viewers and listeners. Some football news first up. Group F of the Prime Minister's Cup football competition produced 12 goals last night at Haynesville in St. James. In the end, there were victories for Empire and Cave Hill. Double dose of sweetness at Haynesville for the Prime Minister's Cup. First matchup, Cave Hill in the blue taking on Martindale's Road. 11 minutes in and the little magician, Roger Collins, gets the ball at his feet and parts the Red Sea. A laser of a shot from the right boot and into the onion bag. The beige and Messi on the score sheet, annihilated, 1-0 to Cave Hill. 
More first half pressure, 37th minute. Cave Hill on the go again. The defense unable to bring this one down to earth. And Collins in the perfect position, slips past two defenders. And talk about a quality service provider. Rivera Williams on the doorstep. Eventually puts it in. Cave Hill 2. Martindale's Road nil. The boys in shocking pink in need of a confidence booster. Damn moments of the first half. Eric Joseph goes for a stroll pass. Four blue shirts before hitting top speed. And the nutmeg of the goalkeeper. The stamp of approval. That's called a one-man wrecking machine. 2-1 then at halftime. Switch of ends, turning point in the contest. Block free kick attempt. And Collins release down the left. Look at the speed. One defender in. Terrell Bennett to beat. Takes a tumble. And referee says that is as straightforward as they come. The last man and commits the foul. Red card offence. Martin Dales Road down to 10 men. Only one more goal in this one. And it came in the sixth minute of time added on. Collins raised a sharp cut down in the 18 yard box. Crystal clear decision. Penalty coming. Skipper Kemar Watson takes up the challenge and he beats the outstretched arm of Terry Graham. That's all she wrote. Careful with the 3 1 victory over Martindale's Road. By the time the second match was ready to go, hundreds of spectators have surrounded the venue to watch Empire take on United Stars Alliance, aka USA, in fluorescent green. Eight minutes into the match, and the Blues running in behind the USA defense. Van excellent link up play. Stefan Doyle destructive in front of goal. 1 0 to Empire. Zachary Brown level for the USA in the 17th minute to make it 1 1. But five minutes later, a mistake by the goalkeeper gave Mario Phillips a freebie at the back post. That was a gift wrapped in gold. Empire 2. USA won, second half, Empire in the attacking third of the field. No rush, precision pass in the key. And Terry Rollock on 50 minutes beats the goalkeeper at near post. Empire on cloud nine, up 3-1. They were camped out in the USA. Half of the field forcing their opponents into several mistakes. The goalkeeper out to sea and Kemar John given the red carpet treatment. From the angle, that's superb, 4-1. This match would eventually finish 6-2 in favor of Empire. Zuri Morris putting his name on the score sheet in the 75th before T.J. Arthur of the USA made it 5-2. But the final nail in the coffin was compliments Ronaldo Bignall of Empire in time added on as the Blues crush United Stars Alliance. Six goals to two. Yeah, lots of action there. Well, part of Gall Hill may have started their Prime Minister's Cup campaign with a one-all draw against Whitehall Titans. But we are in the early stages of the competition and the Christchurch Base Club has been putting in the work to achieve winning ways. We made a trip to one of their training sessions in this segment of Let's Play Ball. Let's Play Ball. Here's a look at the team scaring up to do battle in the inaugural Prime Minister's Cup. We're looking to play some good football, entertaining football, so that your fans can come out and watch us play, motivate us, and we're looking to deliver. That's pride of Gall Hills captain Ramon Wallace, as he's leading his side in the Prime Minister's Cup with the intent to lift the big grand prize. Last year's Division One winners are not in unfamiliar territory when it comes to winning ways, and they're taking this competition just as serious as any other. Practice started in earnest about two months ago at their home base, Briar Hall, under the guidance of head coach Barry Taylor. And while he is focused on getting his team in tip-top shape on the field, there's also another strategy they've put in place. 
What I'm doing is I'm encouraging all the fellows to come out and go and watch the other games, the, see the competition that we have to play against, so that they know exactly how teams play and all that sort of thing. So we get together as a group, we come out, we go out, and we go and watch the games. Sizing up that competition, Taylor knows it will be no walk in the park. Well, right now they call our group the group of death, where we have Paradise, Wharton, and Whitehall. And I can't underestimate nobody, especially when you have Paradise and Bottom. They're good teams and also Whitehall. So we, they played against us in first division and they give us a good run. We played two matches against them. We won one and lost one to them. So I am not underestimating nobody, but we can go in there and give our best. Greatly confident with ourselves. As long as the fellas keep training like how they are training, we should do well in the competition. So these are the boys from Pride of Gall Hill looking to bring home the bacon in the Prime Minister's Cup. That was Let's Play Ball. We just got some insight into the team scaring up for the inaugural Prime Minister's Cup. Well, that is indeed my first half in sports. And come back, we've got a bit of uh, news, more news rather for you about cricket. And of course, you're watching the CPL, Pearson. Damien, thank you. We'll take a break. We're coming back with tonight's business report. In business tonight, the relationship between the Development Bank of Latin America and the Caribbean and Barbados is moving to the next level. The bank is setting up a regional office here later this year. That's according to Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, Ryan Strawn, as the two entities celebrate the 10th anniversary of partnership. The minister says the 10 years have been challenging, but a fulfilling one for both Barbados and its citizens. Last year, we, I went to Parliament and we approved the additional subscription uh, of our shares in, in CAF which allows us to be able to access more resources um, given that we've already done a lot with the initial um, subscription in relation to, to, to CAP. And therefore, as we go through this, this recap of capitalization of our um, shares in the institution, Barbados can be assured that the government of Barbados is accessing um, the most um, concessional financing to help us to be able to deliver on not just the development agenda, but really, really to open opportunities for Barbadians at home as well as abroad. The bank's regional manager, Dr. Stacy Richards Kennedy, has called it an important occasion and a milestone for Barbados. In the partnership uh, spectrum, you have partners that are considered neighbors, you have partners who are considered friends, but you also have partners who are considered family. And when CAF reaches out to its shareholder countries, we treat each other like family. And that for us is very important. For our executive president, Sergio Diaz Coronados, our vice president, Christian Asinelli, that is the spirit with which we work with our shareholder countries. And we're really grateful to the government of Barbados for always um, being so warm towards CAF and to, you know, for working with us. Art as a business is challenging in Barbados. That observation has come from Luxembourg-born Barbados-based artist Martine Pillay. The artist talks to Trevor Thorpe about art as a business from MZ Pillay Visual Arts at Arch Hall St. Thomas. Trained in France, Switzerland and the UK, Ms. Pillay's work includes painting, mixed media and ceramics. The artist, who has been living in Barbados for 42 years, tells the business report it was a culture shock for her setting up here. Calling it a long-time dream, she says she has been resilient and has weathered the storm. 
In the beginning, it was a little table, a little space on the table, and I would do miglnatures. And uh, um, then, as things went a little bit better, I had more space, and I was working from home. And uh, back in the days, what I was doing as well, I was working with uh, real estate companies that were doing management of villas and properties here on the island. And uh, so they asked me to produce some work for those mansions. So that was a good business for me. She says Barbados is attractive and offers options, but one has to get adjusted. It was a culture shock, definitely. Um, I suppose it was a different environment, and it was an environment as well where I had to impose myself some kind of ways. Uh, very often I had the feeling that there was a label put behind my persona, and I did not really think it did fit it. So in the beginning I had to reduce my work to the amount of space that I had. Ms. Pelé says pieces from MZ Pelé's visual arts hang in the Queen's Park Gallery, the Central Bank of Barbados, and the collection of Caribbean art, Spitestone. Trevor Thorpe for the Business Report. Time now for tonight's trading report. In Jamaica, Jamaica Producers Group Limited with 22,429,951 units was the volume leader, followed by NCB Financial Group Limited and Grace Kennedy Limited. In Trinidad and Tobago, Massey Holdings Limited was the volume leader with 347,524 shares changing hands for a value of Trinidad and Tobago $1,215,824.55, followed by JMMB Group Limited. And here in Barbados, no securities traded today on the regular market. Well, that's tonight's business report. We'll take a break here. We're coming back with a look at the weather with Carrie Ann O'Neill. In the forecast for tomorrow, the sun is expected to rise at 5.47 and will set at 6 minutes past 6. Now, the first high tide, that's expected at 5.32 in the early morning. The first low at 19 minutes after 11 in the morning. The seas, they are calm to moderate in open water with swells peaking at 1.5 meters. The winds coming in from the south to the south-southeast, peaking at 20 kilometers per hour. For us here in Barbados tonight, we are expecting cloudy skies along with some showers and an improvement in weather conditions thereafter. Over the next three days, light winds along with strong daytime heating will maintain cloudy skies along with showers during the afternoon. The second half in sports is now with Damien Best. Thanks so much, Pearson. Well, defending champions, Ghana Amazon Warriors have moved ahead of the Barbados Royals into second place of the Republic Bank CPL after last night's victory over St. Kitts and Nevis Patriots. Batting first at Warner Park in St. Kitts, the Warriors posted the second highest ever total in the history of the CPL, 266 for seven. Player of the match, Shimron Hetmara, fell short of a century, being dismissed for 91, and that was laced with 11 sixes. Ramanullah Gurbaz added 69 with four fours and six sixes, and Kimo Paul smashed 38 of just 14 deliveries. Well, in reply, the Patriots put in a valiant effort but were dismissed for 226 of 18 overs as the Warriors won by 40 runs. Andre Fletcher got 81 with four fours and nine sixes, while Gurukesh Modi took three for 34, and Inram Tahir three for 48. Warriors and St. Lucia Kings both have four points at the top of the standings, but the Kings have a superior net run rate. Tonight's fixture in Antigua will pit the host team, Antigua and Barbuda Falcons, against Trinbago Knight Riders. Falcons have been sent into bat, and after 10 overs, they are 86 for 1. The action is live on MCTV Sports Match Channel 310, while it will be shown tape delayed from 8.03 on CBC TV 8. That is my time for sports tonight, Pearson. It's back over to you. I'll tell you, thank you for your time. Damien, have a good night. We'll be right back. 
Well, that's our time tonight. Thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Bowen. For the crew, to all of you, good night. By God's will, we'll see you tomorrow.